So, Amanda, do you want to take it away? We can go to the next slide. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, yeah. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Peets. I am the Administrator over Policy Data and Analysis Division, which includes the Climate Office. Um, this is our fourth and final planned uh, TINA advisory group meeting. Uh, TINA, again, for those uh, wanting to know what the acronym stands for, is the Transportation Electrification Infrastructure Needs Analysis. Um, so the focus of today's meeting will be the draft report. Um, so this is kind of the big ta-da moment for the study that details transportation electrification charging infrastructure needs and recommendations moving forward. Uh, the bulk of the meeting will be spent on the report with a focus on modeling results and associated gaps that we've identified. And then that will lead into um, a policy and recommendations discussion. And then we'll talk about implementation priorities as well. We've allotted two separate times in this meeting for public comments, um, which is kind of unusual for how we've run these in the past. The purpose of doing this is to make sure that we capture comments early and um, so that first public comment period is to inform conversations um, moving forward throughout the duration of the agenda but then we also have a lot of time at the end of the meeting so that non-committee members can react to the overall discussion um, and kind of weigh in on anything that we've missed during the day um, so we really are trying to focus comments on folks that are on the advisory committee but again have allotted a couple separate times for other people to weigh in if they're interested. Um, and so Stacy probably already covered this, but if you are interested, if you could indicate so in the chat so that we make sure that we um, call upon you at that time. We'll end today's meeting with a look ahead to next steps, um, which is likely to involve many of you, um, particularly if you have interest, but others um, just because of the role you play with your organization or otherwise. Um, since we have a lot to cover, I'm not gonna belabor this. So let's go ahead and dig in. Um, Stacy, if you can take us away. Yep, I think I somewhat covered this already. Um, I think you guys know where the mute is, where the chat and the participants are, I covered. Um, I don't think anyone's going to need to share their screen today. You're um, welcome to turn on your video at any time. I think connectivity is probably better for people without. Um, but if you make a public comment and you want to turn on your video, please do. And that's just the second button in. And at the time, if you don't chat that you want to make a comment, feel free at the comment period to raise your hand. And that is if you hover over your own name in the participants list, you'll see a little hand that you can select and then we'll know that you want to be called on. Okay. Next slide. Amanda, did you want to do roll call? Sure. So, um, you know, we've had four meetings to date. So most of you know each other, know who's on the committee, but we also wanted to actually do a roll call today just to recognize each of you for your participation in this important effort and getting us to where we are today. Um, so, Mr. Alderson, are you there? Good morning, Greg Alderson from Portland General Electric. Thanks, Greg. Mr. Ashley? Okay. I don't Tom's think not be on yet. I don't think so. Okay. Mr. Barnhart? I'm here. It's great to be here this morning. Great. Thanks, Bill. Mr. Chandler? It's Ms. actually. Good morning. Ms. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> My apologies. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Ms. Dodds? I see her. I think I saw Marie a minute ago. Okay, well, she's on, maybe just not able to unmute. Uh, Judge Farrar, might be mispronouncing your name. I don't see hey, her. Ms. And, Ms. It is Marie with AAA. I am here today. I'm having internet issues. So as soon as I turned on my video, my sound went wonky. So I will turn off the video again for connectivity so that um, I can hear you guys. Anyway, good morning. Thanks for letting me serve on this group. Thanks, Marie. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, Ingrid? I think Alan Bates is here uh, in Ingrid's stead. Alan, are you there? I am. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks, Alan. 
Mr. Stu Green. Uh, good morning, Stu Green, Climate Analyst, City of Ashland. Nice to see everyone. Thanks, Stu. Uh, Jamie Hall. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jamie Hall from GM. Nice to be here. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Zach Hinkin. Good morning. Zach Hinkin from Cadeo Group here. Joe Hall. Hello. Good morning. Juan Munoz. Um, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Seth Munoz with EWIP. Thanks, Juan. V, are you on? Good morning. This is V. Nice to be here. Thanks, V. Corey? Corey Scott, are you on? I see Corey on the list, um, but maybe cannot unmute. Okay, so Corey Scott's with Pacific Core. Um, so if he's on at least, hopefully he can unmute later. Jay Raj? Okay, Charlie? I don't see Charlie. Okay, and Dexter? Also don't see him. Looks like we're missing a few committee members. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to join later. Um, again, if anyone's having trouble muting or unmuting the bottom, that the button is at the bottom of your screen. Also check your phone. You're not muted, double muted, which I happen to do quite often. So um, just trick us on the trade there. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I'm not gonna do the roll call of the project team members. Um, most of them will be speaking out today, um, but I do wanna acknowledge all of these team members for the hard work that they've put into this effort over the past six months. Um, it's been a lot of work, um, a lot of good conversations, and I think some really quality projects that we have in front of us today. So thank you uh, to my team, but also the amazing consultants uh, that we have here in front of you on the slide. So thanks team. So uh, with that, are there, is there anyone Stacy that signed up for, or has indicated they wanna provide comments first thing? I do not see any, Liz, can you confirm that there are no hands up and that we haven't seen any requests? And Confirmed, no indication for public comments. We can um, add this time, I think, Amanda, safely to our comment period at the end in case we have more comments then. Great, sounds perfect. Next did, slide. Did we check with Zechariah to make sure that there were no comments that came in that he needed to um, address? Zechariah, are there any comments that we need to address with the group? We received two comments. Um, in preparation for the meeting, I can share them now or, or later, whenever is convenient. Um, why don't you do it now? Okay. Um, Chris Andretti sent a an email uh, uh, suggesting charging locations at new apartment complexes throughout Oregon and also for, for charging locations at state of Oregon facilities, um, including prisons. And Franny Brindle um, encourages us to uh, consider charging sites near ODOT owned right of ways throughout the state. Those were the, the only two comments we received. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing those now. Thanks. Britta, is this going to be you? That is me. Hi, everybody. Good to be here today. Let me just very briefly um, not take up too much time here, but walk through the modeling that actually took place on this program, the analysis and modeling, and um, and arrives us at a point where we've got some numbers we can finally talk about how many how many charging stations or chargers are actually required in the state of Oregon and over what time frame. So let me give you some perspective here and just keep in mind that as as as, as soon as I tee up 
these um, the, the modeling and the results from all of this work that's taken many, many months to complete. Uh, we'll follow this with all the pil policies and the infrastructure priorities. So there, there's some really good meat coming and it'll all tie together. But this was sort of the, the starting point of you know, what needs to happen to achieve the kind of numbers that I'm going to show you now. So hopefully you've all had a little bit of time to glance at um, either the executive summary or the full report and maybe even some of those appendices. But there's, a, there's just a treasure trove of information there. All kinds of heat maps and graphs and bar graphs and use cases. Um, are there for you. Um, everything is provided for you and, and available to anyone in the state. So let me now just focus on sort of a high level review of where we started and, and where we got. So this, uh, of course, is the Tina study. Um, there were sort of two areas of focus. One was to evaluate the, the charging infrastructure needs for light duty vehicles primarily, but we, we did also look at other transportation uh, sectors and I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. Secondarily, we wanted to look at the policies and the priorities of how you implement where you implement um, to accelerate the charging infrastructure um, in general. So if you look at the graph down here, this is the starting point. Here are the state's goals for uh, vehicle electrification. These are the zero emission vehicle goals. And you see that in 2020, we were aiming for 50,000 electric vehicles in, um, in Oregon. We were shy. I think we ended up with about 33,000. So we need to consider that and, and just that enormous challenge of getting to targets. And, and what a concerted effort this is going to require of everyone working together to get to the next milestone. Uh, the target for 2025 is 250,000 electric vehicles. By the time you get to 2030, we're talking 1.1 million and 50% of new vehicle sales. And then the state's target for 2035 is two and a half million electric vehicles and 90% of new vehicle sales. Let's see on the next slide. Let me just talk about the scenarios just very, very briefly. We are almost exclusively going to focus today on the base case or what we call the business as usual case. And, and again, the, the point, if you remember the last slide, the key here was that we wanted to look at sort of different scenarios given again, think back 6 months. We're deep in the heart of COVID. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how we're going to get out of this. This um, situation, we don't know what's going to happen to the economy. And so we devised three different scenarios, a base case, a rapid. So about a base case is if COVID never happened, right? We're on that acceleration curve. We were doing pretty well in Oregon. The, the sales year over year looked very, very good. And so this is a scenario that says if it hadn't happened and we were sort of the economy strong, the sectors are sort of behaving the way they were behaving before COVID, the transit performance, TNCs, remember again how our lives were about a year and a half ago. That's the base case, those kinds of um, scenario conditions. We looked at two COVID related cases just in case things looked a lot different than sort of a, a base case and getting back on track. One was a rapid recovery where everything kind of gets back to normal at the end of 2021. But of course, you've lost some times and you have impacted transit, you've impacted TNCs, you've, you've impacted a lot of the way we work and commute to, to, our, to our jobs. And then finally, a slow recovery scenario where it takes a lot longer. This drags out. We really don't get back to normal until maybe the end of 2024. Keep in mind that the rule for the scenarios was that regardless of the scenario we chose, in the end, in 2035, we have to achieve the state's goals of 2.5 million vehicles and 90% of new vehicle sales. So that's the condition. But what happens in between today and 2035 is sort of dependent on, again, what scenario. But again, today, we're only going to focus on this scenario one, the business as usual case. On the next slide, let me just talk very, very brief, briefly about the use cases. So I, I mentioned that the light duty vehicle sector was really the, the, the pri primary purpose of this entire TINA study. Um, and that light duty vehicles encompass urban light duty vehicles, rural light duty vehicles. And of course, we had a use case called corridor light duty vehicles. But there were also some other use cases that we wanted to also take a look at. And we, we did actually model most of the rest of the cases. We've got local commercial and industrial vehicles. Think of those as medium duty vehicles, right? Urban delivery vehicles and so on. Buses, we looked at both school and transit buses. We looked at the TNC uh, network companies. These are the Ubers and Lyfts out there. And uh, we looked at long haul trucking and then micro mobility. And we, we, we took a look at a very special case called disadvantaged communities to see, are we delivering sort of an equitable solution here when we talk about how we're mapping infrastructure solutions across the state. So with that in mind, I am going to show you now um, in a second here some of the results. This slide here talks about how did we do the modeling. So, the, so the, the method was you start by forecasting all vehicles um, for each use case and in each scenario going forward. So gasoline, diesel, 
electric vehicle. Just what's the forecast for vehicles in those youth cases for each scenario going forward? Then we forecasted of that population of total vehicles registered, what's the population of electrified vehicles in that um, in those use cases and across each scenario? Of course, there are a lot of assumptions. You can find all of that right up in the appendices talking about what were the conditions we were looking at? What are we assuming uh, for transit and for TNC, et cetera? The third step in the process was then to identify and determine how many chargers are required to meet the, the energy load of the electric vehicles in step number two. So we've got a whole bunch of vehicles in step number two for each of the different use cases. How many chargers are required to satisfy that load in the different years going forward? And then finally, in step four, we disaggregated that result, the number of chargers, and said, what does that look like when you actually place these across census tracts or across counties, depending on the use case? So, for example, light duty vehicles, we can model as um, a um, set uh, on the on the census tract, right? Uh, they, they, they're registered at a home. We can, we can model the vehicles that way. But when it comes to buses that traverse many, many different census tracts, we actually looked at that across a, a county uh, divide. And so allocated all of our charges across the county. So again, all of that data is available. You can actually find per census tract per county um, how many charges we're talking about here. And then there's one more thing on the next slide we did to the model. And that was we ran an optimization set of cycles, hundreds of hundreds of runs of the model to understand, can we sometimes sort of um, optimize and minimize the number of charges needed by leveraging one use case sectors designed for charging stations for the use of another sector. So for example, it's possible that some long haul trucks could actually tap into and use some of the, the, the local commercial and industrial uh, vehicle charging stations, just a few of them. Um, over on the, on the light duty vehicle side, you can understand how TNCs uh, Ubers and Lyft might also pull up and just charge at an urban light duty vehicle charging station or something that's been categorized as a rural light duty vehicle charging stations, let alone a corridor charging station. So there's there's overlap in there. And because of the optimization, we're able to extract and take away some of the chargers to minimize the cost of this um, endeavor. So if I just glance hey, at the hey, next, hey, yes. Um, there's a question in the chat from one of our committee members, Ingrid Fish, that asks, for step two, did you figure out the forecast based on the target numbers that you shared earlier? Um, oh, oh, these the state targets. Um, the let's see, or did we did we forecast electric vehicles based on the targets? Um, we 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 had to size we we actually had to size it, of course, to get to the twenty thirty five target. And Shen Shen's on board, and he can he can he can. You know, comment here if he wants to. Um, we had to actually comply with the two and a half, two, two and a half million vehicles in 2035. That was a hard and fast rule. So the numbers did actually have to get to 2035 um, for every one of the uh, for each of the three different scenarios. So there was some um, adjustments we had to make to make sure that by 2035 every scenario arrived at that endpoint. Does that answer the question? All right, we can pour through that in more detail afterwards and, and Ingrid, please just get back in touch with me if you're looking for a little bit more information. Um, let's go ahead and um, look at that next. The, the Tina results slides. Yeah, so here it is. You guys don't have to memorize these numbers. They're all in the in the executive summary and elsewhere in the report. But if you wanted to sort of take away, what did we find across the various use cases um, and across the different um, interim milestone points and the final endpoint, right in 2035. What did we find as far as the number of chargers required? And um, here's here's your here's your crib sheet right here, right? Urban light duty vehicles requiring uh, 8,000 uh, chargers in 2025, and these chargers are a combination. On this slide, it's a combination of workplace chargers, public level two, and public DC fast charging as well. So you can kind of see the magnitude. You can also start to visualize. The, the enormous growth and um, in, in charging infrastructure that's required between 2020, sort of the starting point for the model, and 2035. And um, you can see rural, corridor, lo uh, local commercial, et cetera, just all the way down, cascade your eyes down the, down the list here. Total number of chargers in 2020. Um, in this model, we actually um, forced the model to assume that there were the state goal of 50,000 electric vehicles in 2020. So in 2020, had there been 50,000 electric vehicles in Oregon 
it would have required 35, 3,525 chargers. Of course, we only had 3,000, uh, 33,579 vehicles uh, by the end of 2020. And so those are the numbers we're moving forward with. But um, so there was a reduced number of charges that actually were needed in the, in the infrastructure. And so again, what do we see here when we look at the bottom line here, the increase of, of 480% or five-fold increase is required in charging infrastructure. Uh, between the 2020 goals and the 2025 numbers, a 20 fold increase from 2025 to 2030, or I'm sorry, from 2020 to 2035. And when we look forward to 2035, there's a 44 fold increase required in the number of charging stations. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually bring this point a little bit closer home when I show you the split here in a couple slides. So just kind of look at those numbers. Keep in mind, maybe the 155,000 chargers required in 2035 to satisfy two and a half million electric vehicles in Oregon. Keep that in mind. So on the next slide here, I'm on slide 13 for anyone following in their own deck. Um, we see here again, those same numbers we talked about in that summary table of the, again, that was a business as usual scenario and the optimized case. We have taken advantage of that optimization that we ran through in the model as well. So here you see the bars, right? Growing from 3,500 chargers up to 155 chargers in 2035. You also can find here just one of the heat maps that shows over time, and this is a census track slide right here we're looking at, the number of chargers as they're increasing per census tract over time. And again, all of this is provided in the appendices, all the data is available to all of you. But you can kind of see, again, that things look a lot different. The picture that we're painting in 2035 looks a lot different than sort of the, so, the, the smaller volumes of chargers in those early years between 2020 and 2025, say. If we go now to that next slide, let me show you the breakdown of chargers, because this is always really informative to me. So what we've done is just not to, not to put all the use cases in here, but let's just focus for a moment on the light duty vehicle scenarios. So we're talking now about the urban registered light duty vehicles, the rural registered light duty vehicles. We're talking about the corridor stations that were required to help move people around the state. We're talking about the TNCs themselves, the Ubers, Lyfts, and we're talking about the disadvantaged communities. And when you take that, those five use cases and take a look at how much infrastructure required, you start to see, and, and of what type is required for the business as usual case, you see that in 2025, we are talking about, about what is that, 13, 7, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 15, 16,000, about 16,000 chargers now required to support just the light duty vehicles in Oregon. Half of them are going to workplace chargers, and the other parts are, are basically split evenly between public level two and DC fast charging. So I often use DC fast charging as just an easier to sample proxy. I can see it easier on a map, sort of get an idea for sort of how much expansion and how much growth we need to see in infrastructure. So when I look at sort of the DC fast chargers that we need 4,400 DC fast chargers in five years. If you think about where we are today with about 400 DC fast chargers, um, you start to understand we're talking about a pace of expanding DC fast charging that looks like about 400 or 500 chargers every year between now and 2025. So it gets a little bit, you know, we have to consider the pace of growth here that's going to be required. And then, of course, look further out to 2035, 30,000 DC fast chargers. So there's a lot of work to be done between now and then, but um, this is sort of the, uh, this is the path to get onto the uh, state goals. And, and then I wanted to, on the next slide, let's just talk about micromobility just as a special case here. So the micro in the micro mobility case in 2035, we actually have projected quite um, quite extraordinary growth in micro mobility. So micro mobility consists of correct e bikes, e scooters, e skateboards, for example, and based on largely based on Portland's goal to um, to move 25% of commuting by 2035 to e mobility, we've actually built the assumptions for micromobility on top of what Portland is assuming. It's a big influencer in the state. We assume that that's going to spread an influence across the state. There are similar objectives in California and elsewhere. So when we look at 2035 and, and micromobility, we are actually assuming that 25% of urban trips are going to be uh, delivered through micromobility, and that's up from 3% today. So quite an extraordinary growth in, in micromobility. If we look at the rural trips, okay, there will be a more modest increase 
in the use of uh, micro mobility. But you see today from 0%, we are still forecasting about a 5% growth in e-mobility in the rural areas of the, of, the, of the state. That results, because now we can take advantage of assuming that a number of commuting trips and, and movement of folks around the state, because it's going to be done with uh, micro mobility, we've actually included that in the model to assume that some of them, the charging stations can be um, taken away reduced, right? Because we're, we're actually replacing that with a lot of home uh, level one charging and just regular home outlets. That's explained on the next um, line down there too. So again, this, in the case of the micro mobility um, scenario or the use case, we've just assumed that it's largely going to be, uh, char these vehicles are largely going to be uh, charged using level one chargers at home. Um, and as a result, we can actually reduce some of the need for public charging for light duty vehicles. And then once we sort of considered the light, the use of, um, of, of level one, 110 volt outlets for most of the charging of electric mobility. So your e-bike charges and plugs into the garage outlet or, you know, somewhere, you know, near your kitchen or your outlet outside your home. Um, when we think about though, this growth, this, this enormous growth that's coming in micro mobility in 2035, 25% of, of, of urban trips will be micro uh, served by micro mobility. Then you understand that we're actually going to have to make a much more visible presence in the solutions for charging these vehicles. So now we're talking about a much more visible presence at workplaces. Think about public destinations in particular. How, how do you get to beaches? How do you drive up along the beaches? Um, how do you get to parks and museums, et cetera? So micro mobility is going to need its own strategy for understanding what feels like pervasive um, infrastructure and how does it feel like it is in the places where people are going to want to take these um, electric mobility um, um, bikes and scooters, et cetera. And then finally, I want to sort of just walk slow, just walk quickly through the the eight remaining use cases. Um, and so, what did we really find in the study, and and what does it really mean for us as we sort of evaluate what those numbers are, are telling us? So, when we look at the urban and rural light duty light duty vehicle cases, I've sort of just brought, brought them together because a lot of the assumptions are very similar. We have numbers that now show that EVs are going to grow from thirty three thousand five hundred seventy nine electric vehicles that are uh, registered here in December of 2020, the actual number in the state, that's going to grow to 250,000, uh, the state target, in, um, in 2025. And um, I want you to notice those next two numbers there, that of the 250,000 registered EVs in, in 2025, three quarters of those are going to be found in urban areas, but a quarter of them are going to be found in rural areas. So it's really important here throughout the study to, to keep in mind that this is a broad state need for charging infrastructure. There are a lot of vehicles that are going to be driven large distances in these very rural geographies. And then the second point there, chargers are going to grow um, from 523 DC fast chargers today. That's in aggregate all of the chargers in the state, 500, 523 according to Oregon's DOE. And um, that has to grow to 4411. I showed you that on the previous slide in 2025. That um, is going to be made up of 1400 Six chargers, DC fast chargers. Again, I just use this as a proxy to help con the conversation move along. 1400 rural chargers, more than the 880 required in the urban setting. So again, we actually need more chargers in rural areas than we do in the urban areas because of those vast distances that have to be covered um, and, and make sure that we're satisfying the movement of travel across those rural areas. And then in addition, I, and there are other there are other needs for the for the chargers there. Of course, there'll be some DC that goes into the corridors and into TNCs, et cetera. But I also want to remember on that second bullet down there that, that we don't want to overlook the need for public level two. And of course the workplace charging that prior to COVID was providing an awful important um, service for folks that were commuting to and from work in their electric vehicles and wanted that range extension to get back home. Um, and then the third bullet down there to, to close out the urban and rural, 90% of home charging today is our assumption, decreases over time to 60% in 2035. That's just an assumption in the model. Um, this happens because uh, public charging becomes much more available as does workplace charging. And EV adoption is growing now in more into across the uh, multi-user um, dwelling community. So the apartments and condominiums, where in fact, many of those, those consumers and EV drivers will not be able to charge. They'll have to use public charging out in front of the building, out behind the building, or you know, up the street at a um, at a DC fast charger. And then let me just kind of quickly, I'm sure I'm running out of time here, but if we sort of move now to the corridor uh, scenario, the, the, the corridor use case, 
Uh, 2000 corridor DC fast chargers are required by 2025. You can imagine those going up and down the highways that are crisscrossing your state, the north, the north south corridors and the east west corridors. We did analyze uh, and model seven of your highway, major highway corridors in the state. Um, that's largely where a lot of these chargers are going to go. A near term priority, of course, then is we need to focus on corridor charging, including the rural and especially think of it in terms of key destinations. Where are you trying to get in the state? And I, I always want to mention, and it's going to come up in spades here when we talk about long haul trucking in a minute, but there's a lot of traffic that comes into um, Oregon from, from California. And when you look at the size of the targets in, in California and what Washington state's doing, you become this major, major corridor. And so you have to keep your eyes not only on what Oregon is trying to achieve in, in its sort of in its uh, nicely defined space, but you're gonna have, we're going to have to look at those corridors and what's coming into the state from both the north and the south. If we take a look at TNCs, what we found um, was that we, we assume that about 15% of TNCs are going to be electric by 2025, 90% electric by 2030, and 100% electric by 2035. In that, in that assumption, we've actually just jumped onto the uh, California uh, clean fuel miles um, ruling in, in California and assume that that just follows up the, up the western seaboard there. 22% of TNC drivers have access to home charging in 2025. And what that tells you is we got to look at home charging, but it also tells you that about 80% of, of TNC drivers don't have access to home charging. And we've got to consider that need when we're placing and thinking about where chargers go in the public space. And then 10% of charging needs, this was a nice find, a nice sort of modeling find, is that 10% of charging needs for TNCs can leverage actually existing urban or to be planned urban and corridor chargers um, based on where the, where the TNCs are traveling. So that's a good finding there too, that we can actually, again, optimize our model. And then finally, in the disadvantaged communities, we wanted to make sure that we were not introducing any kind of bias into the way we're planning um, infrastructure in the disadvantaged communities. And what we, what we found, of course, is that the way we were doing the model, it assumes, you know, we take a look at how many vehicles are registered in each of the different, um, you know, census tracts in the state. And when you do that, of course, you will plan for fewer chargers in places where fewer vehicles are registered, such as in disadvantaged communities. And so what we did here to make a make the result much more equitable and, and over time make sure that we're balancing out um, these disadvantaged communities and access to charging relative to uh, non-disadvantaged communities is we've actually added a 25% sort of up um, ups, up, upscaling for the number of charges added for these communities, just to make sure that by 2035, the, the same number of chargers per capita in, in disadvantaged communities equals the same number of chargers per capita in the non-disadvantaged communities. Again, always trying to make sure that we have access and are providing access fairly to everyone. And then my last slide here is looking at the, the last three use cases. And this is uh, looking at local commercial and industrial vehicles. So again, imagine these as being sort of your medium duty vehicles that are moving um, goods and food and stuff around the, around the state and around your county. 21% um, of MDVs are assumed to be electric by 2035. That was based on some prior work um, in the West Coast Highway. So we've just actually taken their assumption. So 21% by 2035. 90% depot charging is the assumption now in these early years um, for charging 10% en route. This will decrease over time with the um, uh, growth in public structure to about a 50-50 split. 50% in the depots uh, behind the fence at these at these fleet in these fleet yards, 50% on route. And that's something also that the, the model contemplates. And that's where the numbers are also based is accommodating sort of more on route charging as time goes on. In the business in, in the buses case, we looked both at school and transit in here uh, in 2035, 75% of the market is electric and 90% of new new bus sales are electric as well. What that means is you're starting to imagine now, and, and that's vastly going to be served by depot, uh, private private depot charging, right, on site. And so what that means is there's going to be a big challenge here for demand management strategies. It also applies to the local commercial fleets as well. But clearly, we want to just sort of highlight here that some of the policies going forward have to consider that we've got to really work hard to understand what does it mean to be introducing either nighttime loads or even some daytime loads at the wrong times of day. So we'll want to make sure that that's a, an integrated part of the solution space. And then by 200, uh, 2025, you see there'll be a couple hundred uh, e-transit buses projected here. 
uh, and 720 uh, school buses just based on, on, the, on the curves and where we're trying to get here uh, with the modeling. And then we've assumed here for the for the purpose of the modeling, just assumed that light do, that level two charging is going to be um, what's needed for school buses. Um, there 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 is a lot of precedent already for, for level two charging for school buses. They're parked a lot of the day, both during the day and at night for very very extended periods of time. And then for the transit buses, we've assumed for now 60 kilowatt charging. And um, because those vehicles are frequently doing many, many more miles, they don't rest as often as the school bus is not even close. And so they will need some kind of form of DC fast charging. There are some faster chargers out there for buses, maybe on the order of 400 kilowatts, but those are typically for en route only charging. And as sort of we're thinking and, and working towards a sort of a, a the, the, the majority of these buses will be charged at depots. Uh, we're sort of looking at those depots as sort of maybe being served by the 60 kW chargers. And then finally, the long haul trucking. So this is a, a sector that, of course, is going to follow. It's a little bit harder. You know, the batteries, the trucks are just now coming out essentially kind of this year. And so um, we, we sort of see the growth happening. If you look at the heat maps in the in the executive summary and, and later in the document, you'll see that the growth in long haul trucking starts to show up on those maps sort of after 2025, a little bit before 2030. So that's when we start to see trucks starting to show up. And, and here's this comment that I made before. It's really important to not only look at what's happening in the state, but a third of the vehicle miles traveled um, on our highways um, from long haul trucking is coming from California. And so when you look at California's advanced clean truck rule, you start to see that it's going to be enacted. It becomes active in 2024 and then gets much more aggressive as you approach 2035. And if, a th if one third of the, of the VMT is coming from out of state, I should say out of state, so either Oregon, but, but primarily largely here, obviously from, from California, that is a demand that we're going to have to satisfy in the modeling and, and in our planning for where infrastructure is going to go. So that's in a nutshell, sort of the major key takeaways. Keep in mind, there's a lot of policy that comes out of this. There are a lot of priorities for infrastructure that also come out of it. But I wanted to just sort of uh, whet your appetite and tell you what's coming uh, based on a few of the numbers that come out of the analysis. And I'm happy to entertain any questions if there's a little bit of time. There were a lot of questions, but it looks like many of them may have been responded to. Oh, is that Shen Shen in the background working? Yay. <laughs> and Shen Shen and Mary. Thank you, Mary. Very good. Thank you. Uh, it looks like, I think, did everyone's comment, Liz? Uh, maybe you can unmute. Did everyone's comment get responded to? Or if you're a advisory group member and your comment did not get responded to, maybe unmute and let me know. Oh, could could I? This is Phil Barnhart. Could I note uh, what I think is a uh, significant lack in the report so far? Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of the uh, problems with the uh, early systems is that nobody thought clearly about maintenance and repair. Uh, the result of that was that uh, at least one company's systems uh, could not be relied upon for use uh, because they were often down. This is going to be a major issue, especially in rural areas where it's hard to get to them to do maintenance and repair. So uh, one, of, I, I know Goal Six addresses the issue in a very general way, but it needs to be much. There needs to be a very specific paragraph on setting up a system or a set of systems for maintenance and repair so that these uh, things are never down for a couple of hours uh, uh, when especially uh, the quarter uh, uh, chargers. Um, it, it, we're we're going to have people adopting electric vehicles when they know that they are going to be able to charge at a place where it says there's a charger. And that's that's a trick. It's not going to be easy to do. It'll be it'll be difficult and expensive to maintain. Um, I think something more specific than what's in the report now should be set up. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else that has a comment or did not have their comment responded to um, by Shen Shen and Mary? Before we move on. 
I think we have this covered is, uh, Jamie from GM. I, I have oh, one Jamie. quick question, and it's and it's kind of maybe in the, in the weeds. Um, I noticed that in in the report a comment about the optimization modeling, uh, assuming that utilization grows over time, obviously as the fleet grows, and then it says that the hours of the day that the chargers will not be utilized will be fairly minimal. Can Maybe it's in the appendices, which I haven't seen yet, but can you give any more detail about what fairly minimal means? You can imagine some locations that simply aren't going to be used for many hours a day because of the, you know, a workplace. I, I can imagine many hours a day it's, it's just not being used. So I'm just sort of curious what what this higher utilization future looks like, if you can provide any detail. And if that's too far in the weeds, I'm happy to talk offline. Jamie, did you, are you did you specifically uh, are you specifically talking about workplace charging or just broadly across all chargers? Broadly, it, it looks like this comment in the report was broadly across chargers on on optimization modeling, and, and I, I was just okay. giving workplace as an example. Uh, and and okay. you would be another example. Of some of these where it seems like there might be actually quite a lot of hours of the day where where it's probably not being used. Um, okay, we want so maybe we should have an offline con a conversation about that, Jamie. Because again, you know, one of the one of the concerns about having so I, we, I need to go look at what the numbers were. I, I actually had them on an assumptions sheet. I, I'll, I'll actually provide to you an assumptions, you know, percentage of you know how much utilization. In fact, we have utilization for every every set of the chargers and for every use case. But one of the things you have to be careful about, right, is that if you have too much utilization of a station, you have queuing, and so you have to avoid queuing. You you can't utilize a station so much that it actually drives queuing and then there's just, you know, people are impatient and you actually can't get business done. And you only, you know, you can't really assume 24 hours of operation of the station either, right? You can sort of assume maybe 12 hours, it's, it's easy for people to get to the charges overnight at 2 a.m., not a lot of chargers being utilized at any rate, other than maybe transit and maybe some fleet yards. So let me get back to you. We'll get you the, um, I'll get you all the utilization numbers of stations. Let's have a conversation about that because I'd like to know what you're thinking about that. Yeah, for, yeah for that, that was exactly that. my thinking is queuing and whatnot. So that, yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. Perfect. Great, great question, Jamie. Uh, so I see that Greg Alverson has his hand raised. So Greg. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah just a, a comment. You know, I appreciate the work that has been done here so far. There's been a lot of work done here so far. One thing that I would note that felt like it was missing or, or perhaps underemphasized to me, you know, it is the role of um you know the expectation of, of what's happening in in the market as opposed to just the goals um, i think the goals are are rightfully a big part of this the state adopted those goals we're trying to reach those goals they serve to guide our our work and public policy but they're of course not the only reason that we are seeking to make all these investments in charging and the infrastructure to support it a big part of that reason is because we expect massive growth in these areas and manufacturers seem to agree with that given the significant investments they're making. And um, so I, I guess I would just suggest that in the explanation of the methods and, and the introduction and just sort of the, the framing of all this that, you know, while the analysis is sort of uh, aimed at uh, how do we reach our goals? Um, the reason we need to reach those goals is because EVs are coming and we have to be ready for them. And the state needs to do so in a way that doesn't leave anybody behind as an, and is an inclusive transition. And I, you know, I, I don't think that's totally absent, but I think it needs to be emphasized a lot more clearly that it's not just because the state passed a bill. It's because these vehicles are coming and consumers are going to adopt them. And so we need to thoughtfully and proactively have the policies and investment in, in infrastructure to serve them. So just a comment that I, I think maybe that needs a, a little stronger highlighting in here. Yeah, I think that's great, Greg. I, I actually agree completely. Normally, I only write about that conversation. So now I have to go look at, at why was it a little bit maybe underplayed and not um, very visible. So we'll, we'll go take a look at that. That certainly should come out even in the executive summary. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's in the introduction to the policy section, some, some more of that, but, um, you know, this is a 1st draft. And so, um, we appreciate Good. all the comments on how to make it better. And I agree completely that that the market forces, the battery technology, 
um, the expansive uh, technology improvements that reduce costs, all that needs to be highlighted as a compelling reason for why vehicles are coming and more and more vehicles are coming and all the, you know, that sort of thing. So we can, we can add more of that uh, to the introduction and the executive summary. I also see that uh, V. Takar has her hand raised, and then probably we should move on to the next agenda item here shortly, just to make sure we have time for discussion at the end. V. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, I have a few comments, um, and if um, some of these might fall into later conversations that we have as well. But thanks everyone for your work on this. Um, at reading through the report, I did notice that um, the micro mobility and infrastructure, like it was paired with uh, the, the need and understanding that we need these kind of infrastructure improvements um, to expand micro mobility. Um, and so I appreciate you all identifying that in the report. Um, I think that that's something that we're going to have to be very intentional as well about, um, especially in, in underserved areas, um, in urban areas and rural areas, just thinking about, you know, even the lack of basic, you know, transportation infrastructure that allows for alternative more modes of transportation. So, like, thinking about sidewalks um, and just, you know, even just regular kind of bike lanes as well um, that are non-existent in many parts of the state. Um, including in, or in urban areas, right? Um, and so uh, I think just having, um, I would like to see kind of that more emphasis, just like based on studies that have been showing that as we invest in more public transit um, and alternative modes of transportation, the less number of EVs um, and therefore less number of EV chargers we are going to have to rely on, right? Um, so just thinking about that and as we're continuing, like as ODOT is investing in transportation infrastructure, how are we um, adequately pairing um, that kind of infrastructure improvement to allow for and facilitate um, efficient public transit options that will allow people to opt out of owning a car entirely for the people who who um, do want to make that decision. Um, and so I think that, that this, that it, it's definitely worth emphasizing that we need to, to um, carry. Um, another piece was just, um, uh, I was thinking just uh, one piece for the, um, in the report, there was like getting landlords to, um, you know, either through like an incentive scheme or something, getting landlords to install chargers and, and um, MUDs, I think that's really important. Just to note that it could increase rents. So how are we um, ensuring that there are adequate renter protections in, in various different cities um, so that we don't see a displacement um, of folks uh, as chargers get installed and then people um, are, are wary of that and actually don't want chargers installed because they don't want their rents to go up. Um, so keeping that in mind. Um, and then um, I would say another piece is just like charging companies, you know, um, uh, earlier in the presentation, there was a, a note that uh, uh, charging infrastructure is being installed where there are higher numbers of EVs um, registered. And so just thinking about private charging companies and how they haven't been installing um, chargers where there are a low number of, of EVs because they're based on like market demand and profit. Um, so I think it's going to be it's it's up to um, the public sector and utilities as they're you know um, uh, receiving money from uh, ratepayers and, and installing chargers across um, their territory as well to focus on these areas where there are low numbers of EV charging um, and I think uh, for the public sector as well obviously. Um, and then the last piece that I wanted to mention was just on outreach and education. So. Um, one thing that I didn't uh, see was like uh, coordinating with community based organizations as well. So funding community based organizations um, to ensure that, I mean, they already have like a trust uh, built within their community. They know kind of where the areas um, where events are, uh, where, um, you know, uh, people go to to get certain. Um, get services and get information. So I think that, that would be a great opportunity to uh, coordinate with community-based organizations um, in, in disseminating kind of this outreach and education for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. Um, and then also a piece that I saw that was missing was just um, the language. There's, it, there is a language barrier. So um, making sure that all these uh, 
East Education materials are um, are available in different languages that you're working with community based organizations who speak uh, different languages that are representative here in Oregon to make sure that we're, we're getting um, everywhere. Thank you. These are all great thoughts. We really appreciate um, the thoughtfulness put into those and kind of flagging some areas we need to go a little bit deeper on. Um, I do actually think that's probably a good segue to transition to the policy conversation now. Um, and Eric, I see your hands raised. We're going to just make sure we get to um, the committee member comments first, um, and we'll have some time for for public comment here later, but also, um, you know, a larger discussion once we get into these policy recommendations. So I think Rhett, is that you? It is me. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, yeah. So hey, everybody. Uh, Rhett Lawrence, uh, Pacific Northwest Policy Manager at Fourth. Um, uh, my colleague Eric Wong and I will be walking through um, through a number of the uh, policy recommendations here, and then I'll be turning it over to uh, Amanda uh, at the end to um, to walk through some of the infrastructure implementation priorities. So um, next slide, please. Yeah. So. Uh, you all have seen this um, seen this graphic before in earlier documents. Um, you know, just wanted to revisit it here. You know, basically as an acknowledgement that, you know, while some of the policy recommendations uh, contained in this study are directed at particular stakeholders, um, you know, our hope that is that that uh, you know greater collab collaboration across all of these uh, groups and others uh, it, uh, will result as uh, uh, from the study. Uh, of course, I mean, it's going to be a necessity. I mean, we all have a role to play uh, in this uh, in getting Oregon to the infrastructure improvements we're going to need to to build out our uh, electric transportation future. So, you know, just wanted to to sort of re reiterate that, you know, this is not this report is not, uh, as you've seen, all about, you know, what what ODOT can do and what the state agencies can do that, you know, all of our uh, all of our various entities uh, need to be uh, playing a role in. So. Uh, next slide. So uh, on this one, um, you know, as you all have seen in the report, I hope you had, uh, did get a chance to uh, dig through it in some detail. Um, and investigating uh, that vision of a fully electrified future uh, in the TINA process, um, six overall infrastructure goals uh, emerged. Uh, Eric and I are briefly going to walk through um, a number of the recommended policies to support these goals. I mean, there's, there's a lot more detail in the report, of course. Uh, we're not going to have time to um, to go into uh, in great detail today, um, but uh, we'll walk through uh, the goals uh, fairly quickly and then uh, turn to some of the near term priorities uh, before handing it back to Amanda for a review of those uh, charging infrastructure implementation priorities. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, and on uh, here, I mean, of course, one of the uh, as you saw in the report, one of the most important things to come out of the uh, of the Tina process. Um, is the need to leverage its findings uh, to develop a statewide EV charging infrastructure deployment strategy. So Amanda's going to talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, but the general idea is, you know, uh, we, that we need to create a, a strategy with a, a two to five year horizon that will establish near term implementation actions and priorities to meet the state's EV goals. You know, so in other words, you know, what's what's the game plan for how we get that charging in homes along travel corridors? At work at in fleet depots, travel destinations, and multi-unit dwellings, uh, and so on. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the uh, near-term priority section as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the the second goal that came out of the um, uh, uh, out of the project was to ensure that all of the charging infrastructure that we're going to be building out um, is equitable and is accessible to all Oregonians. Uh, of course, this means that we need to keep a, a particular focus on the rural BIPOC and disadvantaged communities that haven't had much access to charging so far. Um, you know, but really they're they're charging deserts all over the state, and we need to you know both identify exactly what where those uh, gaps are, what you know what where the charging deserts are, um, and adopt you know various measures through you know state sponsored grants, uh, lower new interest financing, clean fuels program funding. Uh, utility guidance and incentives, et cetera, uh, to, to to close those gaps. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that also in the near term priority section. Um, and then uh, I'm going to hand it over to my uh, uh, colleague Eric Wong to to walk through the next uh, couple of slides here. Awesome. Thank you, Red. So just to 
pick up uh, pick up uh, the conversation for the third goal that we have is to ensure the charging experience to be user friendly, convenient, safe, and consistent, uh, which is uh, covering some of the pre pre previous um, previous comments as well. Is that we the, and the first uh, recommendation we have made under the policy recommendation is to lead the public process to identify EV charging needs and standards and create this standard uh, overall. Uh, create this overall standard to ensure a more consistent EV charging experience. And for consistency, we are considering specifically transparency in rates, uh, multiple payment methods, uh, open access roaming, interoperability uh, of the systems or the networks, reliability of the charging stations, redundancies that, that might be required at certain sites, resiliency of those sites in terms of, say, in a outage event or things if there is, should be a backup. And then also, of course, compliances for ADA, which is the uh, disability accessibility uh, requirements, and also finally safety and lighting. All of those will be considered under this uh, consistency of ex user experience overall for charging. Um, and then also we would like to require or we recommend to require all incentives fundings for infrastructure development to meet certain standards for user experience that we have just identified or established in that public process. And also, finally, uh, we want to ensure consistency in the signage and labeling as well, so people can easily uh, locate and leverage and use these charging stations. Next slide, please. Moving on to goal number four is to ensure that all EV charging now offers all consumers the benefits of lower electric fueling costs. Uh, and the recommendations we have provided would be first to establish a working group of utilities and EV charging providers and key stakeholders to identify the barriers and opportunities to address the cost of EV charging. Um, this could include uh, re recommendations in rate designs or uh, a restructuring of demand charges and other costs driven by the installation process as well. To identify the cost and then understand the cost and come up with a solution out of it would be the first step that we recommend doing. And then secondly, we recommend to consider incentives that drive infrastructure development across the entire transportation landscape. And thirdly, we want to encourage appropriate rates for distinct EV charging activities depending on charging profiles uh, or, charger, or charger types, because there should be a differentiation between how much you should be paying at a uh, DC fast charger versus a level two public accessible charger, and also, of course, user groups depending on maybe uh, maybe income groups and and other criteria. And then finally, uh, we would like to recommend a streamlining of the EVSE or charging station permitting processes as well uh, to ensure the installation of EV charging to be efficient, cost effective, and speedy, which will accelerate our our infrastructure uh, infrastructure deployment process so that we can get to the goal faster or timely. Uh, next slide, please. For uh, goal number five is to ensure that utilities are positioned for the rapid expansion of EV charging statewide. So we want to encourage utilities to accelerate their EV make ready investments if possible um, to make sure um, charging infrastructure can go in uh, with, with the abundant help uh, from the key players or key stakeholders. And as a as a background, EV make ready refers to uh, the infrastructure costs associated with preparing a site for EV charging, uh, EV charge installation. So it could be before the meter, uh, so behind the meter, such as a, such as a distribution network, trans, uh, transformers, and the meter itself. Uh, and then also it could it could also include behind the meter infrastructure, such as the electrical panel, the conduits, and the wiring needed to connect the charging station at the parking spaces. Um, and secondly, what we would like to recommend is to uh, also reassess or assess the innovative, uh, assess innovative rate designs to consider how to best create maybe DC fast charger specific rate structures, because currently what we have heard uh, or what we have uh, found out in our research is that DC fast charging station deployment has mostly been uneconomical due to the uh, due to the current current rate structure in terms of demand uh, charges, and we need to reassess this rate designs and see if we can uh, find a better solution, uh, better solution for these in, uh, for these deployments uh, of DC fast chargers. And we recommend to convene a work group of utilities and key stakeholders to uh, identify the optimal locations with available grid capacity for DC fast chargers, and also assess and plan for. Uh, the potential charging impacts of the future grid capacity 
and try to make sure EV or I should say charging infrastructure overall becomes a integrated uh, integrated element towards the overarching uh, resource planning uh, of the utilities. And finally, we recommend to explore and maybe develop recommendations to increase overall system resiliency as EV adoption takes off and maybe consider uh, how, how we can put in more resiliency in the overarching system and maybe leverage the use, uh, leverage the adoption or the increased adoption of electric vehicles as well. Uh, next, next slide, please. And for the final goal or sixth goal, uh, which is a, a larger, uh, grander goal is to develop the foundational policies and provide resources to support stakeholders to build and benefit from a zero emission vehicle future. Um, what we mean by that is first, we want to recommend that we can provide educational and technical resources and assistance uh, to support all stakeholder groups seeking to pursue EV charging installation. And uh, we would like to recommend to develop and fund a statewide educational and technical assistance program uh, to do that or to, to achieve that. And secondly, we want to recommend that we should ensure EV charging is available in new residential and commercial buildings uh, and maybe existing buildings when they, are, when they go through major upgrades or major renovations. Or overall, uh, uh, what I will what I would like to call is to adopt EV ready building codes and parking ordinances uh, to enable uh, maybe local jurisdiction to adopt uh, more stringent reach codes so that they can require EV readiness in their uh, in their localities, depending on the situation as well. And thirdly, we would like to recommend that we should grow a skilled and local workforce to build EV infrastructure and expand economic opportunities stemming from EV infrastructure expansion. And uh, this also kind of respond, responds to the previous comments uh, that I believe within this uh, within this program, we can definitely make sure as we grow the skillful workforce, we can also combine this with the prior uh, standards that we have established in terms of reliability and, and uptime to make sure we do have not just the requirements, but also the workforce to support that kind of requirements as well. And then finally, uh, we want to encourage public charging options for other mobility options, such as electric micro mobility. Uh, and we want to encourage maybe additions of 110 volts outlets for these, uh, for these micro mobility options for public charging. And then also we highly recommend to come up with a study on how best to encourage uh, E or micro mobility options and explore charging, uh, charging in the context of a broader evaluation uh, of actions needed to support adoption of these electric uh, mobility, mobility options, rather than only being a single uh, single focus on uh, on on vehicle adoption overall, because we do think there are other options that might uh, that might work better at certain scenarios as well. Um, moving on uh, to the next slide. Here, uh, me, me and my colleague Red has just covered the six major goals briefly. Uh, and also what we believe are the recommendation uh, recommendation of policy that we want to uh, recommend to achieve these goals in the coming years as we work towards the uh, work towards building the infrastructure for SV 1044's goal. But in the short term, we do have a few initiatives that we'd like to focus on. And as you can see on the screen, there are the SEF infrastructure de deployment strategy, uh, the target uh, target equity in the overall ch charging. EV ready building codes is a, a key thing that we can do right now. And then statewide education assistance. And finally, the state uh, to lead by example are, uh, are the five major policy initiatives that we believe we should focus on. And I will hand it back to my colleague, Red, to, to elaborate on the first two, uh, first two policy in initiatives. Thank you, Eric. Um... Yeah, so um, as, as we noted uh, in the discussion of goal one above, one of the most important things that come out of, out of the TINA is the need to jump in quickly with a range of stakeholders to develop that uh, statewide ZEV charging infrastructure deployment strategy. And again, Amanda's gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, in her section, but you know, how do we create that two to five year game plan to establish some near-term implementation actions and targeted state investment, investments to, to meet all our needs? Um, you know, we think these measures should uh, prioritize actions for areas of high residential density uh, near major employers, uh, near public transit access, and in uh, rural and disadvantaged uh, and underserved communities. Um, one other piece to uh, to note here that hasn't been mentioned yet is um, 
the sort of auxiliary uh, TINA uh, study that's been done about hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, it wasn't part of the specific inquiry uh, in the TINA process uh, up to this point, but there will be a, a supplemental study uh, happening later this year to assess those uh, related infrastructure needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, as mentioned earlier, and as we've discussed a little bit uh, in uh, some of the comments um, uh, from from VPaycar, um, you know, we, we're going to need to make sure that that um, as we're building out all this uh, charging infrastructure in the state, uh, that we're going to be um, uh, doing it in an equitable manner uh, and in a way that is accessible to all Oregonians. Um, so that's why we've we've identified equity and charging as a as a second near term priority, so that we can keep that focus on the rural uh, BIPOC and disadvantaged communities that, that really just haven't had much access to charging so far. Um, and we think there are a number of ways to, to bring that equity lens uh, to this work, um, starting with incentivizing investments uh, to close, uh, close those gaps um, in those charging deserts, especially in the rural areas uh, and in communities of color. Um, another way, uh, important way to assist in those efforts is investigating ways to coordinate and ensure Charging access for those Oregonians that are eligible for the uh, for the income qualified charge ahead rebate, um, as it as it gets easier and easier to uh, for lower income folks to to uh, afford and purchase these vehicles. Of course, they're going to uh, need to be able to to charge them as well, and so we need to make sure that we're that we're uh, giving them access to to charging. Uh, also, need to keep an emphasis on expanding uh, workplace charging, uh, finding ways to incentivize employers. Uh, to install it, um, and if we can especially strive to uh, provide uh, those kinds of incentives at, at women and my, minority owned uh, businesses, uh, we can uh, assure ourselves of, you know, even greater equitable uh, outcomes. Uh, so, uh, hand it back to Eric for the next couple of slides. Cool. Thank you, Red. And so for our next one, uh, it's about EV ready uh, building code or EV readiness requirements overall. Um, and this is something that we can, and I believe we are currently working on. Uh, so just to provide a little bit of the status quo on the EV, uh, EV readiness requirements in Oregon overall right now, um, the state building code requires about 5% of the parking spaces to be EV ready if it has more than 50 spaces. And also there are actually multiple options to comply without actually providing electrical service. Uh, and uh, which means that this, requirement is not as strong as we hope it to be. And at the same time, the state building code also preempts local government to adopt more stringent requirements uh, for the reason of having a unified and more, uh, I would say, yeah, a more unified requirements across the board, but it's but it actually um, does, does not allow or preempt lo local jurisdictions to, to take stronger actions should they want to. Um, so um, this leads to, leads to sort of a, a, a weaker requirement at, uh, from the top down. And then uh, what we are currently working on uh, in the in the, in the legislature it, legislature session right now is the House Bill 2180 that will that will that will essentially uh, require a 20% of charging capacity at new developments such as MUD buildings and commercial buildings that is more in, in line with the overall uh, uh, best practices across the country right now in terms of EV readiness. Uh, this is going to be uh, a a much stronger uh, stronger requirements overall, and it's going to be a strong assistance towards the acceleration of uh, charging infrastructure deployment. Because EV readiness is a cornerstone to enable the built environments, like the buildings, to take into account electrical needs of EV infrastructure from its development. This is going to result in great amounts of avoided costs compared to retrofitting the building after it's built. And it also provides the needed certainty for utilities to plan for their infrastructure and their own resources as well. So that is why it's really, really important. And finally, um, this EV building code or EV readiness building code requirements will bring the necessary access to electricity or power into the parking spaces where the vehicle will be parked for a long time. And, and that's where they should be charged if they are all zero emission vehicles or electric vehicles. And this will overcome the significant barrier that's currently imposed in buildings like uh, apartment buildings or condos, and also maybe workplace uh, buildings as well. And it will enable more locations to have the capacity or capability to provide charging infrastructure. Um, next, please. So the next uh, priority that we want to focus on would be the statewide education and assistance program. Um, at current stage, in order to achieve the goals for 
uh, to charge and user experiences for uh, affordability and also lay down the foundational policies. The statewide educational and technical assistance is paramount to kickstart this effort because at this early stage of EV adoption, a proactive outreach program uh, with hands on experiences such as, you know, ride and drive events and also uh, maybe workshops uh, uh, are at, uh, at priority markets and also communities that, that, that would need more assistance in this will be key to achieve the goals outlined uh, in, in the, the five out goal, I'm sorry, six goals outlined in the previous uh, uh, slides. And we think uh, broadly accessible and user-friendly materials will be vital to ensure uh, the fair distribution of outreach and education information. Of course, I think as uh, V has suggested, um, working with uh, local CBOs will also be a wonderful option. And we believe this outreach program will become uh, like we described, one of the initial key points of contact to lead to more resources and make sure these communities get uh, what they need in terms of resource to be part of this inclusive transition. And finally, uh, or uh, and finally, we believe a technical assistance to provide guidelines and model processes will also be great, uh, and especially uh, in the realm of permit streaming uh, streamlining. That's another key initiative that we can take action right now to lower the overall cost, not just financial, but also transactional costs in terms of time uh, waiting for the turnaround to accelerate the overall deployment of charging infrastructure. So that wraps up my portion, and I'd like to pass it back to Red uh, to explain how the state can lead by example. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, and hopefully uh, this one kind of speaks for itself. And we do think there there are plenty of opportunities for the state to to you know show the rest of us how it's done um, on this on this work. Uh, in addition to expanding its own fleet of vehicles through the Department of Administrative Services, it'd also be great to see more um, charging uh, installed at various state properties, you know, office buildings, state parks, state rest areas, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so this will, you know, provide both um, what help provide convenient workplace charging, both for all of those uh, state employees, um, and can also uh, help meet the general public's uh, charging uh, charging needs as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I am now going to hand it off to Amanda Peets to talk about some of the key infrastructure uh, implementation priorities. Great, thanks, Rhett. So as you've probably started to observe through today's presentation, um, and also if you've had a chance to look at the report, we've tried to dice recommendations several different ways. Um, so from the overall policies to the grouping of important policies or policy initiatives. Um, and now what I'm gonna talk about is some of our implementation priorities. Um, these implementation priorities are intended to help us as a state focus more on key investments and specific actions. As you can see on the slide, we've identified three categories of implementation priorities. Next slide. So the first is for light duty electrification across the state. So along corridors and in rural and urban areas. So for corridors, we've identified a phased approach, um, whereas in phase one, we focus on designated alternative fuel um, electrification corridors. So we had some in existence previously, we've just received some new designations. So it covers I-5, Interstate 84, um, Interstate 82, US 20, US 26, um, and a few other locations as well. So the focus would be on these designated corridors, kind of key corridors in the state um, with DC fast charging, um, spreading those out every say 25 to 50 miles. Um, in phase two, we'd look at um, adding chargers to other corridors across the state, um, probably in the range of starting out at 75 to 100 miles apart and pursuing opportunities to shorten those distances when they can. Um, so this is, again, kind of the section we're trying to get into a few more specific recommendations of where to focus. Um, so as we talk about rural, we're generally referring to um, our communities that are smaller um, and are non-metropolitan areas. So areas outside of Portland, Salem, Ben, Eugene, Medford, and so on. Um, so this would focus on level two chargers. A um, couple reasons why is those are less expensive. Um, also, uh, as we heard from several of you at our last committee meeting, um, charging at level two means people are staying a little bit longer, which can support local tourism um, and really the idea of a stop and shop. Um, so there's some other benefits there as well. 
Um, we recognize that some of the most prime locations in rural areas are at public buildings and other federal, state, county, or city public lands. Uh, so that's probably the highest potential areas. Um, and, you know, in addition to level two chargers, the DC fast chargers would be needed in between communities. So again, on some of those corridors uh, connecting communities in our rural areas. In urban areas, so our denser and larger cities, um, DC fast charging will play a role here, but we need to be careful from a cost and equity perspective about how we do that. So looking for hub locations or central sites where we can um, support transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft and their charging, as well as near multi-unit dwellings. Uh, the most promising thing likely to support multi-unit dwellings in denser areas is to locate level one and level two chargers um, in hub areas or community charging sites, such as uh, shared parking lots and areas where people can plug in overnight. Um, obviously, and as many people have alluded to in the chat, workplace charging is also key um, and can be supported by level one and level two locations as well. To ensure an equity focus, and Rhett mentioned this earlier, our recommendation is to prioritize workplace charging for women and minority-owned businesses. So, um, of course, all businesses are important. If we can kind of prioritize there first, um, then I think that helps us along with some of our equity goals as well. Next slide, please. Uh, related to workplace charging is our second implementation priority, which is fleet depot charging. That focuses on charging of public sector and company vehicles. Um, the most, what I would call ready of the fleet vehicles are the light duty cars and small trucks. Um, so hence, our first focus is recommended on light duty vehicles. Um, the recommendation here is to incentivize on-site fleet charging. Um, incentives could come from the clean fuels program, uh, utilities or other programs. And where public funds are used, um, we want to encourage fleet charging to provide public access to the community on weekends when possible. Um, so we get there's some likely challenges there, but you know, if we can use dual purpose for some of these facilities, um, it certainly expands accessibility to, to more of Oregon. Um, the two next priorities are for local and commercial delivery and transit and school buses. Um, so I'll start with transit and school buses first. Um, so we have a few transit agencies in the state that have started to integrate electric buses in their fleet, and they're putting, um, they're piloting uh, how best to utilize these types of vehicles. Um, funding from programs like the State Payroll Tax for Transit, otherwise known as STIF funding, help to incent turnover to electric buses. Um, but adoption, we're finding, is still pretty slow. Um, we've provided some good educational materials and um, information to transit agencies on this conversion. Um, but again, we still see that adoption is slow. So I think the experience that the transit agencies who are piloting right this, this right now will be really key um, in helping to demonstrate how um, conversion to electric buses can be workable. Um, some of the existing pilots are a partnership between the transit agencies and the utilities, um, and we see this connection as key given the size of the transit load on the system. Um, for school bus buses, we have pilots underway as well, um, where we're exploring two-way vehicle-to-grid resiliency opportunities. The most direct benefit of these clean vehicles will be to the users. So as we focus on transit and school buses, for transit, that's often vulnerable populations. So some direct benefits there. And for school buses, it's zero emissions for our children uh, that are traveling on these modes. Um, on the local and commercial delivery side, uh, many private fleets like Amazon are already starting to electrify and do this, and others are watching that closely. Um, On-site charging is more practical for vehicles that have fixed routes and return to home base at night. And the direct benefits of this conversion um, in urban centers is really that air quality for the people that live and work in those areas. Next slide, please. The third and final implementation priority um, is you know, looking at the larger side, so um, the larger freight trucks, um, long haul trucking, and medium and heavy duty charging. So MHD stands for medium and heavy duty charging. Um, policy directives along with technology and market 
incentives is really starting to move um, the big ZEV sectors. Um, so again, medium and heavy duty sector, but is not as far along as the light duty vehicles. Um, nonetheless, from an emission standpoint, zero emission vehicle um, freight trucks are really key. Um, the public sector, utilities, and others need to look for ways to support industry working with the trucking stakeholders directly. We've started to identify some key corridors. So we are supporting um, or exploring options for hydrogen, and we've designated a new hydrogen corridor in the state along I-5 that connects California and Washington. We're also looking um, to the same light duty vehicle corridors uh, that I mentioned earlier for potential for freight electrification. So Interstate 84, US 20, um, some of those locations. In these areas, we need to actively look for federal and other funding options and utilities might look for advanced planning opportunities. Um, they need to have a lead time um, for this because it can be take a while to develop sites for a 500 megawatt charging or higher. Um, in addition to corridor charging, a key will be on-site fleet depot charging, where incentives will be needed to help buy down the installation costs um, where those fleet vehicles are parked. So not only the corridors along route, but also the kind of home location of the vehicle. Next slide. And I'm, I swear I will be done talking soon. Um, this is just kind of the next step. So I wanted to give you a preview here. I can pull this up again at the end uh, so you get a sense of where the TINA study is heading. Obviously, we have a lot of work in front of us, um, uh, mainly focused on implementation of the findings from this report. So we'll be establishing some work groups to execute on those policy recommendations. We also want to extract uh, the key actions from Tina and build on those. Um, so as Rhett mentioned, we're gonna create a specific two to five year development plan. Um, so that will be kind of the key roadmap with um, more precision to how we need to um, actualize what we've identified here in Tina. And then lastly, um, we didn't get to everything that we wanted to, or at least at a depth that we needed to in the Tina study. Um, so we have some follow on studies planned, um, one for hydrogen, one for micro mobility, um, and then also looking at doing a number of what I call translation documents. It's taking the information in Tina um, and focusing it to um, a specific entity or region or area so that um, the results can be kind of uh, digestible and understandable um, in how we put those things into action. With that, I swear I will finally stop talking <laughs> and we can get to your feedback on the content that's been presented today and in the report. Um, so this is where we wanna make sure we leave plenty of time for just straight up discussion. Um, and it looks like, Corey uh, from the committee has his hand up. So Corey, maybe we'll kick off the discussion with you and then um, rely on Stacy and others to kind of peruse the chat and see what questions we wanna answer out of that as well. And Amanda, so I wanted to just remind, remind folks really quick that this is for the advisory group right now and we will have public comment following um, just shortly. So focus on the advisory group member discussion, thanks. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Super clear set of recommendations. I really appreciate how it's been formatted to kind of help people look at, you know, bucket by bucket are the things that I believe are important covered here. Um, that's really helpful. So as I as I thought about it, as you were walking through it, and I don't know if you plan to put the slides back up, it's probably unimportant, but slide 35 highlighted the near term priorities for light duty charging. And I noted a distinction between the urban priorities and the rural priorities. In one case, level two charging at workplaces was highlighted as a priority in urban space. And in the rural space, level two charging, workplace charging was not included. And I just wondered if you or somebody on the team could just provide a little more insight um, in trying to connect dots from earlier in this meeting about you know that all in effort that needs to happen in the rural space. Um, but at least in this moment, not seeing that workplace charging in rural space as a priority. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I don't know that it was um, necessarily intentional to leave out the, the workplace part um, as part of that priority. Um, so I don't know, Red, if, 
if you or Mary kind of want to weigh in on that point, um, if we did try to draw a more of a distinction, um, but I think we recognize kind of to your point, Corey, the, the overall need that exists there. Um, so Mary or Rhett, do you want to add on to that? I, I would just say that Corey, that uh, we probably just highlighted in the few words that we use for prioritize the concept of tourism charge and stop destinations um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, other community destinations, but did not intend to explicitly exclude a workplace focus. So I think, um, you know, I think we can probably clarify that and make it more inclusive, but there's not, there's not really a desired uh, or targeted intention to exclude workplace in the rural areas, just more of a recognition that there is period less charging in rural areas and that workplace charging can be exclusive to those who just work there, right? So uh, while it's very, very helpful and critical to enable people who don't have, especially if you don't have good charging at home to have good charging at workplaces, that if you want to be more, you know, sort of ecumenical and get everybody an opportunity, uh, the destination and the public work charge, uh, workplace, I'm sorry, public charging for level two, um, maybe a little bit higher priority, or we wanted to call that out at least. Does that answer your question? It does, uh, thank you. Great, thanks Corey. So maybe we'll pull the slides down again so you can see people's faces. Um, if committee members don't mind uh, turning on your camera just so um, we can see your reactions and eye rolls or um, you know claps or whatever as you're echoing what other folks are saying, that would be super helpful, so thank you. Um, looks like we'll go to Phil uh, next and then uh, Thomas and then um, maybe Stacy if we can, if there's any highlights you wanna call out on the chat, making sure we're doing that as well. Thank you. Uh, am, am I up? Uh, this is Phil. Okay. Um, I have. A, I also have a, a couple of uh, what I think are nits to pick. As I was reviewing, reading through the report, uh, there are a whole bunch of places where there are maps of the state with various colors on the different counties. Unfortunately, the labels are too small to read. Uh, and they need to be, it, it, it needs to be formatted in a different way to make it uh, usable. Um, I, I love the idea of having those, uh, those maps, especially the sequences. Uh, and, and overall, this report is really good. I, I really appreciate it. Um, the other, uh, 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 another nit that I wanted to pick that I didn't include in the chat is uh, the difference between a uh, uh, an EV charging station and an EV charger, uh, that's a real net. But because uh, the Oregon Electric Highway often included only one DC fast charger at each location, I think it's very important to somehow note in the report that when you're talking about a station, you're talking about multiple uh, EV chargers based on the uh, likely use. My suggestion is that in rural areas uh, it, it, where, you put, where you put DC fast chargers, you have a minimum of four. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, two reasons. One is uh, when people are traveling, they're all traveling at the same time. Uh, the other is uh, uh, your term convenience and uh, your term reliability are greatly enhanced. Uh, if one of these chargers is down, the other three are still usable. Somehow or another, I think that particular net needs to be picked just because of the history uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, Oregon Electric Highway which uh, was a great thing when it was built, but, uh, but was almost immediately by those of us who use it found to be obsolete. Yeah, great point, Phil. So I think absolutely accessibility of the report, readability of some of the graphics, we'll be working on that and refining that piece. Um, and I think Phil, to your point, we're going through a process right now with the West Coast Electric Highways um, and addressing some of those issues that you flagged um, just a moment ago. So I think, you know, if we can put together some recommendations on you know, number of ports and chargers and um, kind of what that looks like, rather than just making some blanket set statements, it probably helps um, just take advantage of some of the lessons we've learned thus far. Great comment, thank you. Uh, Thomas. I'm so, I, I was going to say, but Phil, to, to your point, 
um, both Electrify America and Tesla pretty much only put in quads at their DC fast charging stations. And uh, this report is recommending redundancy. Um, and we can be a little bit more explicit in trying to encourage that level of redundancy for the DC fast. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Thomas Ashes. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, so I, I just want to offer my continued compliments to uh, the, the fourth crew and, and everyone involved, um, certainly with the policy recommendations and, and where things are going with, with the report effort. Um, I, I think there are a couple, couple flags that I just want to make before, unfortunately, I've got to leave a bit early today. Um, I, I just, I think it's, I think we all recognize that, um, you know, sort of the, the make ready stuff is, is really common sense for utilities to do. I think there's good recognition of, you know, the need for an important utility role, you know, in, in the go forward. But I, I do think certainly nearer term, hopefully less so over time, there are also really clear needs that are not necessarily, um, from, from my perspective, well enough communicated either in the recommendations or, or where things are going with the report for utility investment beyond uh, the make ready. And so, I, I mean, I think I and, and green lots are a bit agnostic as to where that, that money necessarily comes from, but if it's not coming from utilities, certainly in a number of deployment contexts earlier on, uh, that would likely need to be funded elsewhere by, by the state. So I think that there's a good opportunity just to uh, draw that line less clearly nearer term uh, with utility investment, um, but with the, the recognition that indeed, optimistically at least, that will be less uh, important over time. Yeah, great, great points. I appreciate um, kind of broad, making sure we're, we're thinking more broadly um, about those pieces and and weighing in there, Thomas, thank you. Um, okay, it looks like Zach Hinken from the committee uh, has his hand raised, so Zach will go to you. Um, and then continue folks to raise your hand if you wanna see your comments out loud. And then once um, we have exhausted committee members who have raised their hands, we'll go to the chat piece. So Zach. Yeah, thank you. Um, really great work team. This has been comprehensive and, and visually it really allows a lot of information to, to, to come over. Um, so kudos for that. Um, I, for rural fast charging, I mean, and seeing kind of the numbers and the goals that we need to reach in the next several years, um, wanted to also just flag for consideration, like the, are, are we encouraging or incentivizing the pairing of a battery storage with those DCF See, um, knowing that rates are a challenge, knowing that access to the, the right power is a challenge, like um, making sure that we're including that in the balance of systems, or at least considering it to make sure that um, any site developer can just use every bag of tricks they can to make that functional. Um, so just acknowledging that rural environment, rural D DC fast charging siting is going to be a bit different than what we see in all their urban environment. Yeah, great points, Zach. Um, I think definitely something to think about and been going, going back to the lessons learned and, and battery storage with West Coast Electric Highways kind of in the future. So um, definitely something we can flag there. Okay, Jamie Hall. Uh, uh, thank you. So I guess first just a, a process question. I sort of had some thoughts on wording and some in the weed stuff throughout and is it best to just follow up with an email on some of these comments afterwards because I, I don't want to waste time right now on that kind of stuff sure that'd be great so at the end we'll put up a slide with Zachariah's contact information but um, most of you have probably seen emails from Mr. Heck um, throughout this process so um, go ahead and feel free to, to line up the document if you need to or uh, flag certain sections and send those comments to him Okay, and then picking up on uh, Tom Ashley's comments, there was a lot of talk toward the end about sort of priorities and, you know, what kind of charging do we need and where. I saw less discussion about how to actually make that happen in terms of, you know, funding and, and kind of 
what actually needs to do to, to speed this along and to make a business case where it doesn't currently exist or to overcome some barriers is, is the idea that that deeper dive on, on how to meet those needs sort of falls into this next phase, the, the two to five year plan? Yeah, um, I think so. So um, I would say I've in some ways made my team and the consultant team uncomfortable by um, you know, the, the focus of the TNS study was on the needs. Um, and then we've kind of pushed that into how do we, you know, how do we translate the needs into what we should do um, and the recommendations piece. So we, we stayed um, high level in some places, try to go a little bit deeper to have a little bit more meat to the bones, but really um, some of the stuff that you're bringing up is um, what we need to figure out next and dive into and kind of workshop a little bit more with the right folks around the table. So that is uh, part of the next phase. Okay, sounds good. And I'll follow up with an email on some more specifics and questions throughout. But... Great, thanks, thanks Amy. Um, okay, so Stacy, um, is there a few comments you wanna call out of the chat. Obviously, I just want to also point out, we have a record of the chat from these meetings. So, you know, any comments that you put in here, um, we will go back and look at how we try to address in the report. But especially if there's any questions, um, anything you want to flag on there, Stacey? There's no questions. A lot of the chat that's happening now is kind of supporting people's comments and reiterating them. Um, a couple of them, the need to allow apartment and condo residents um, to charge in their own assigned spaces in order to motivate EV adoption. Um, someone reiterated, I believe it was Phil's comments about the importance of maintenance and repair and prioritizing communities impacted by climate events. Um, and Phil has another comment that I hadn't seen yet about batteries and local renewables to reduce the need to l run long wires, solar and wind local with battery storage is um okay and so maybe agreeing with that um, so thanks okay great um so i see ingrid raise her hand um so ingrid will will float to you and then if anyone else you feel like you do want to call your chats out as part of this verbal discussion feel free to raise your hand um and we'll be happy to call on you too so ingrid yeah yeah mm -hmm. oh it looks, oh it looks like echoing Okay, can you hear me now? Um, so I just wanted to call out a couple of other things that are conversations that are happening at the state that are connected to this, just wanting to make sure that um, we're kind of uh, consistent with all the different um, realms and conversations of things that are happening. This is a little bit more outside of the realm of charging, but it is connected to increasing EV adoption. And I just wanna make sure that with with regards to conversations on the RUC, so the road user charge, as well as the tolling conversations, that we're kind of pushing in the same direction here, where we're trying to really support um, EV adoption and with regards to that as well. So um, coming up with like road user charge that actually um, encourages climate, um, our climate goals and encourages people to get into EVs. Um, I know everyone needs to pay their fair share but there should be some kind of carrot and stick um, pointing towards um, trying to get people out of the um, diesel and gas vehicles and into electric vehicles. Um, and so trying to have that, those um, uh, indicators be consistent with where we're trying to go here as well. I'm going on and off of the mute. Um, so yeah, great points. And I think that's part of um, <laughs> the challenge we have, I would say overall um, with the climate office and ODAT is um, connecting all the various policy pieces that are out there. So there's um, certainly some legislation that's, that's out there, but um, one of those, I think I mentioned is our uh, road usage fee. Um, and we've heard definitely some um, concerns and thoughts raised about kind of how to structure those programs to be supportive of what we're trying to achieve in the electrification space um, and kind of flagging where we might be at odds in some of those pieces. Um, so I think those, those broader policy conversations are gonna be key um, as we proceed too. Thank you. Great, 
There's no new chat, Amanda. Um, and I don't see any new hands raised. Okay. Well, um, I'll just give give folks a moment that are that are shy. Um, so <laughs> I'll just I'll just talk for a sec. So we, you know, as I mentioned, uh, next steps we are forming some uh, stakeholder groups to work some key issues. If you have a lot of interest in the study and kind of want to see how things get uh, move forward, it'd be great if um, if you send a note to Zachariah and say like, hey, I want to stay super engaged or, you know, here of the things in the report, you know, you talked about X, Y, or Z, and that's really uh, near and near to my heart. I'd love to workshop how to move that forward. Um, you know, we'd love any of your um, any of your contributions moving forward because uh, it's going to take a team of us all figuring out kind of how we do this so um, as much as some of you are willing to participate with us we'd just love to have you um, most immediately in front of us is um, delivering this report so um, the report was a requirement in executive order 2004 which was the governor's executive order on climate last year um, the report is due by june 30th of this year um, so, hence uh, the deadline that's shown here on the right. Um, we're trying to finalize this document, so we're going to give you all a week from today. So that would be two weeks total with the report uh, to submit draft comments back um, to Zachariah. So we'll take um, any comments that came today, and we'll look at how we incorporate those in the report, both verbal comments and in the chat. Um, but if you have any additional thoughts that didn't come up or you have some more specific edits or suggestions, um, please feel free to send those in to Zachariah by the 18th. Um, so with that, why don't we go ahead and, and cover the second public comment period? Um, and I know Eric Smith has been patiently waiting for quite a while. <laughs> uh, with his hand raised. I'm sure it's gotten super tired by now. Um, thankfully, it's virtual. So uh, why don't we start with Eric and then Charlie and then anyone else, please raise your hand or indicate in the chat or just unmute yourself if you're able and we'll uh, be happy to, to call on you. So Eric. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is a great group. Um, love the mission and the goals of what is being proposed here. Fantastic and the work that's being put in. So my name is Eric Smith. I work for Semi Connect. We make level two charging stations. Um, I, I, I want to share a couple of things. Um, industrial employee workers. Um, one of the things I, I do get is, you know, the idea of putting charging stations in a lot of the, you know, the uh, industrial type buildings where there's construction going on. And I get a lot of times property management says, you know, none of our employees here would ever get an electric vehicle. So why would we do that? I have to mention to them that there's easier ways for people who are not as well off to be able to get electric vehicles. And it's something that's never brought up and I always feel like it should be. Um, we're not discussing how to help people get electric vehicles. And there's a rule that consumers should always consider when it comes to technology. And that rule is, it doesn't work every time, but it's probably 80, 90%, I guess, I don't know. The rule is consumers should always buy mature technology and lease changing technology. Gas cars are mature technology. Of course, I'm not saying we buy gas cars because that would defeat the whole purpose of today's meeting. But if you're going to buy something that's mature, that's what you should do. Gas cars are mature technology. There's really nothing new about the technology of gas cars. And they hold their value. That's the reason why you would want to buy them and not necessarily lease them. But conversely, electric vehicles, you want to lease them. Because I can tell you, I'm on my fourth electric vehicle in nine years. They've all been leases. The amount of money that we're going to spend over 10 years is going to be less than had we bought our first Nissan Leaf that had only 85 miles of range, and we wanted to get rid of it after a few years, knowing there's a 100-mile range, a 150, a 250, and so on. But leases, usually the, the monthly payments are about the same as what a person spends in gas. Now, I don't know how to make this happen. I really don't. You know, I know there's a point where you, you go, well, we can't go out to the dealerships and tell them how to do it. But I talk to dealerships and they're like, they have no idea that they should be leasing electric vehicles. Um, I mentioned it also, I also hear all the time I, um, from people saying, well, I would get an electric vehicle today if I could afford to buy one. And I go, er, record scratch. You said the word buy. You're not supposed to buy them. You're supposed to lease them. Once I explain it, they're like, oh, I get it. And I can tell you, I probably know, and this is no lie, I probably about know from 60 people who have now leased an electric vehicle that said that they would have never done it otherwise. 
Um, I just don't know how this can get out into the masses of saying this would be a helpful way to get more electric vehicles is to help them understand that lease is a way to go. And then they, they don't have to uh, worry about upgrading or they can upgrade it easier as a result. Um, also, I just want to mention uh, SemiConnect. I'm not going to go into detail if somebody has a question about this further, but someone brought the point about charging stations are not really reliable or not functioning and all that. I can tell you SemiConnect has actually worked extremely hard on this, and I think we have a really unique approach to it. Um, sort of like it's, it's called swapping it out, essentially. Um, it swaps out quicker, and we can get the stations back up and running. And many of customers have actually tried one station and tried ours and said, wow, yeah, your stations are up more often, more reliable as a result. And if anybody wants to hear more, you're welcome to contact myself or our company. But um, that is a huge issue, and I think we 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 want to address sometime if anybody wants to hear more details how that's discussed or how it's accomplished. And then the last thing is um, the charging up all at once. Let me say this. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. Gas car drivers, what gas car drivers do typically when it comes to refueling their, their gas car is they'll drive their car until they get down to about a quarter of a tank. Then they start looking for a gas station and then they do a full refill all at once. And this happens about once every four or five days. We're finding that what we predicted is actually happening, and that is EV owners are doing the exact same thing. They wait about four days to do a full charge, and the full charge could happen while they're at the workplace or when they come home at night to like a multifamily sort of thing, right? Um, what that means is, is that there's sort of a four to one ratio for EV owners for one station. One driver might charge Wednesday, Monday night, another one would do Tuesday, another one would do Wednesday, the fourth one would do Thursday, and then the cycle would happen again. And I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, one station that makes four people happy and they trade out every night, but if you kind of think of it in that term, that they can plug their car in at 6 p.m. at night, charge it up all night long, disconnect it around, you know, 6 or 7 in the morning, they're going to say, I'm good for the next four or five days, right? Um, so I love the ambitious number of charging stations. You better believe I'd love to sell you that many charging stations that have been asked for, but it may not need to be that many if you take the approach that people don't really need to charge their car for more than once every four or five days with their gas cars. So what might be so different with their electric vehicles? I don't know, but there you am. I see I was guy shooting himself in the foot saying, don't buy as many charging stations, but I'm just kind of proposing a, a, a way that might be something to be considered as well. That is all. Thanks for your time. And um, if anybody has any questions, please reach out, reach out to myself and we'll go from there. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate you uh, being part of the conversation and uh, sharing your thoughts and comments. Uh, so next we'll go with Charlie. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Charlie Loeb. Uh, I work with Phil Barnhart and the Emerald Valley Electrical Vehicle Association down here in Eugene. Um, I had just one, well, a, a set of things to say all related to one comment. Um, I note that you refer very much in this draft plan to various incentives that will result in uh, electric vehicle charging station deployments. Um, sometimes those incentives are specified, other times they're kind of vague incentives that are out there somewhere, which I assume will be determined as part of the uh, strategy document you're discussing doing as a follow up to this. Um, I note that there are already certainly a lot of charging network companies out there that are working at deploying charging infrastructure and all of these companies i believe probably have a similar goal that they would like a uh to establish some loyalty among customers and establish a network of charging stations so that you can go anywhere in the state or the country and be able to plug into their branded station and be able to get a to get your charge and uh, to they'll have a dedicated set of customers that will frequent their stations often, um, they of course uh, have many obstacles to actually doing this deployment because it's so uneconomic to deploy stations, particularly fast charging stations, in places that are going to have light use in the near future. Um, third note here, and then I'll make my point, is that right now. There is a lot of investment capital washing around looking for some place to go. Some of that ends up going into uh, various electric vehicle investments, uh, people looking to profit on the next great trend. And I think the real challenge here is to figure out a way in order to meet your ambitious goals for a charging station deployment is to pull that capital forward usefully 
in a way to get those stations deployed soon. I mean, I think these charging companies can actually provide a lot of that infrastructure and they will eventually um, as they seek to build out their brand and their networks. And the key is how to get them, how to incentivize them to do that in the next five years, not in 15 years. And I would hope that a piece of your deployment strategy is dedicated, you know, getting some economists and some business people together with folks on this call who work for some of the charging networks and others who aren't on this call to figure out what is the incentive? Is it reducing, you know, suspending demand charges for a time? Is it providing the space at, uh, you know, government owned, uh, if right in the real estate to put the, the charging stations in? Is it, is it something else? Is it just sort of outright subsidies, whatever the case might be, what is that incentive that can pull forward that investment? The dollars are out there right now looking for a place to go. And I think if Oregon provides a place for those dollars to go, that will also get your charging infrastructure deployed in the near term, as opposed to the extended term, that um, that would be one of the most effective um, strategies you could use, particularly for on the uh, uh, the DC fast chargers uh, deployment and getting that network built out across the state in a robust way that will give people, give electric vehicle drivers like myself the confidence that wherever we drive, um, we'll be able to find a fast charger to enable us to go the next distance. Uh, thank you so much. Excellent thoughts. I saw a lot of good head nodding and, you know, some thumbs up from your colleague, uh, Phil as well. So, um, appreciate those, Charlie. Uh, okay. Well, I think we've, um, used our time pretty efficiently today. Uh, so we'll probably end just a few minutes early here. Um, again, if you have any, uh, interest in following up with the study and continuing to work with us through this, please reach out to Zachariah. And by next Tuesday, if you can send your uh, comments on the report to us, that would be great. We will post the, the draft report on the website. If it's not already posted now, it will show up there soon. Um, and we will uh, post the final document um, after we finalize the report. So um, on or before June 30th, hopefully before we'll have that finalized um, and take your comments into consideration. So thank you so much uh, for sticking with us through these four meetings um, and this pretty heady content. And um, I really feel like we're coming out with a great product because of the valuable input that you've provided. So thank you so much um, and hope to